up, we have to treat the conservation of a wooden hull boat that we have to my son. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to the University of North Florida. Tonight's presentation is sponsored by the History Club, Phi Alpha Theta, and the Department of History. We have as our speaker tonight Dr. Keith Holland, a dentist from Orange Park who has been working for years on the Maple Leaf, a ship that was sunk by Confederate forces during the Civil War. Keith has been engaged for a number of years trying to raise artifacts from the bottom, has fought a long battle with the federal government and with other agencies trying to gain the necessary permits, and, and has picked up an enormous amount of information about the ship and, and the people who were aboard it. So tonight, we'd like you to welcome Dr. Keith Holland. I want to thank everybody for coming, and we'll get right into the show. We read about the Maple Leaf having sunk in 1864 on April 1st, and decided we were going to go look for it. And what you see is a river chart, an 1878 river chart. And if you look carefully, in the center of the chart, there are two beacons. One is marked number seven, and the other one is not marked at all. We conjectured that this was, in fact, a channel marker, the number seven one, and the one north of that was a navigational hazard marker. The boat sank in 1864. This is an 1878 river chart. So it was many years afterwards where steamboat traffic had picked up in the St. John's River and the boat was now a navigational hazard. Now this is an 1884 preliminary river chart. And you'll notice that right in the center of the screen is the word beacon, the letters NS for not shown, and then the numerals two and three quarters feet over a very discreet shaded area. Again, we conjectured that this was in fact uh, a navigational hazard. In 1882, 1883, 1884, the Army Corps of Engineers let a contract to have the Maple Leaf removed from the channel. In 1884, they produced another river chart. They went to this plate and they produced a change. In the very center of the screen, you will note that they removed the word beacon, they removed the numerals, and they left the little gray area and also placed a lighted beacon a little bit further southeast. So this pretty much convinced me that uh, not only was this a navigational hazard, but that uh, it was, in fact, the site of the Maple Leaf. You'll note that in 1884 was the first year that the St. John's River acquired lighted beacons. So we felt like we had a very good idea of where the boat was. We acquired from the Department of Agriculture a true infrared high-altitude photograph. This gave us the ability to take modern-day landmarks and merge them against the 1878 and 1884 river chart and give us a better location of where uh, the Maple Leaf was in relation to uh, modern docks. We went out and took some aerial photos, bought a boat towed metal detector, and decided to go out and actually locate it uh, using triangulation techniques with a sextant um, from our river chart. We pulled this metal detector and on the fourth day reached a pretty heavy, um, significant area of deposits. Put on diving gear and slowly descended down into the St. John's River. Now you've got to use your imagination here and picture this. You are slowly drifting down on a bright, beautiful June day into the St. John's River. First year at two feet, three feet, the light begins to close in behind you until finally there is no light. You're 10 feet. You lose perception of how fast you're falling, but you know you're going to touch a soft, muddy bottom and that there's something down there. Well, my imagination began to go wild and I began to see things, <laughs> creatures. And being a dentist, they all had teeth. I knew I was going to reach out and feel this, the back of this thing's tongue. But that didn't happen. What I felt appears to be some sort of axle, heavy, dense metal object. There is a smokestack down there. Feel the side of the ship. You can run your hand down into the muck and actually feel the contours of the boat. So there's no question what that there's a ship there and that we had located it. The next thing we had to do was to mark the spot. We knew 
basically where it was. And we felt confident before we went out there that we'd find it. Now, you'll note that it is in the channel. The Coast Guard will not allow us to place a buoy in the channel unless it is a lighted buoy. And we did not want to do that, nor did we want to actually make a, uh, we didn't want to have an attractive nuisance out here, and we didn't want to attract pirates to the boat. But anyway, we met with the, uh, my brother's electronics firm, and we sat down and talked about this problem with them. We said, now look, we can't put a buoy out there, but somehow we want to mark the site, and we want it to fit within the Coast Guard uh, ramifications. And they said, no problem. They came up with a new technique. We had our equipment there. I got out, changed my clothes, and then put a big X right over the site. Now, I want you to look at this for a minute and think about this. What I'm suggesting is that 20 feet down from this X, buried in six feet of mud, is a 173-foot-long ship that's buried six feet down in the muck and carrying possibly 800,000 pounds of cultural material. It has been down there since 1864. Not in Egypt, and it's not in Omaha, Nebraska. It's right here in Jacksonville, Florida. So now we're going to take a little trip, a historic trip through time. We're going to go back to the year 1851, and we're going to go north to Kingston, Ontario. We find ourselves located on Lake Ontario in the town of Kingston. Kingston's located right where the St. Lawrence River comes into Lake Ontario. It's September. We're standing on the wharf, and directly in front of us is the maple leaf. As I said, she's 173 feet long. She has two smokestacks. She's a side paddle wheel. She's capable of carrying 508 tons of marine displacement cargo. She's of wooden construction and three decks tall. She was designed to carry passengers and freight on Lake Ontario. So we're going to board the Maple Leaf. And as we do, you can begin to feel those huge 27-foot paddle wheels turn and churn the water as we take our little historic cruise. You'll note that she is propelled by what is known as a walking beam. It's a red beam on the top. This beam oscillates back and forth on a steam cam. It is capable of stopping at the height of its pivot and reversing the wheel so that it can go forward and backwards. In the salon are 32 staterooms. All of the windows in the salon are stained glass. They have little pictures in the center of them, and they're enwreathed with maple leaves. It's a very elegant liner, and as I said, was designed to take passengers in quite a nice style along the Lake Ontario. For the first 11 years, we run what is known as the through line. We run from Montreal to Kingston and Hamilton. And then in the year 1862, we are leaving Rochester when something happens. Our United States Congress enacts an embargo against all Canadian registered vessels. We find ourselves caught with a war developing in the United States, a war that divides the states into two sides, two sides that have diametrically opposed beliefs and opinions. Lincoln knows that the side that has the greatest navy has a distinct advantage over the other. So he begins an aggressive program of building up the United States Navy. Two gentlemen in Boston decide to buy the Maple Leaf. We are now in Coburg, Canada, where the Red Arrow is. We are purchased by two gentlemen by the name of Spear and Lang in Boston and leased to the United States government. So we leave Coburg, Canada, and now move to Boston. Arriving there, we pull up on the wharf, we get out, stretch our legs, we walk around and see some of the other vessels, and we start talking to some of the people there. We find Spear and Lang, and in talking with them, learn that they have leased this boat to the United States government to act as a Union troop transport ship. It will be um, involved in the Southeast Atlantic blockade. They are leasing the boat for $550 a day net. This blockade was designed to prevent war material from coming into southern ports, being placed on rail, and transported to various 
battlefields in the interior. So we leave Boston, we skirt down the East Coast. Our first stop is in Delaware, and Delaware carpenters come on board, and they change the ship a little bit to make it more suiting for military service. Norfolk is the first city that we are involved in a blockade with, and we begin to feel the effects of an actual blockade and of a war. And that might very well be us back in the background. Months go by, we participate in the Southeast Atlantic blockade, and we find ourselves finally in Charleston, South Carolina on Folly Island. We are participating in the siege of Fort Sumter. Then something unusual happens that changes our fate. February 20th, a disastrous defeat for the North occurs outside of a town in Florida called Jacksonville, Florida. The Battle of Olusty. It was such a devastating defeat for the North that they retreat back into Jacksonville. Hilton Head is concerned that the Confederates are going to follow the troops into Jacksonville and try to retake the city. So on February 22nd, they give orders for many troops on Folly Island to leave Folly Island and immediately go to Jacksonville. They leave that day, leaving all their baggage and camp equipment behind on Folly Island. We, meanwhile, watch them load the boat days later into the Maple Leaf, and 30 days later, we leave to, form, to actually rejoin those troops in Jacksonville. So we're on the Maple Leaf now, and we're leaving Folly Island, heading towards Jacksonville. We arrive there late afternoon, pull up to the wharf. We begin to unload the deck load when suddenly we are given orders to leave again that night and go up the St. John's River to a small town of Palatka. We leave at 11 o'clock that evening take a nice little cruise up the river, and we arrive the next morning in Palatka, Florida. We find there 42 private citizens on the wharf who wish transportation out of Palatka north. They are aware that within a few short weeks, all of the Union troops are gonna be pulled out of central Florida, and they are concerned about reprisals by Confederates against known northern sympathizers. Lincoln has decided after the Battle of Old Lusty, that Florida is a place that Confederate troops need to be chased into and not out of. So we're more than happy to take these troops, these people on board, 42 of them, and all their luggage and personal effects, and we head back that night towards Jacksonville. We're right off Mandarin Point, when at four o'clock in the morning, <laughs> blow a massive hole in the front of the boat. We strike an instrument of mischief. This is what we struck. It was known then as a torpedo, more commonly known now as a mine. It is a beer keg that has 70 pounds of explosive cannon powder in it, two wooden cones on the end of it to give it buoyancy, and a detonator on top. It is weighted down below the surface of the water so it can't be seen, and then a ship comes along and hits the detonator and blows a ma massive hole in the side of the boat. Within 18 months, we have skirted down the East Coast and Spear and Lang have netted almost $250,000. So the boat's sitting there, 1864. Nothing happens to it. It is a navigational hazard. And the next written document we have is this 1882 document issued by the Army Corps of Engineers. It states, removal of the wreck and cargo of the steamer Maple Leaf. Highlighting that contract states that the removal of the vessel obstructing navigation was done as stipulated in a contract made with Mr. R.G. Ross of Fernandina, Florida. Now, three bids came in on this contract. One was from Ross from Fernandina for $3,800. The highest one was for Samuel Cumming for $14,250. I submit to you that Ross knowing the site and knowing the area, realized he would not have to remove the boat, would not have to unload the cargo, that all he'd have to do is to blow the obstructions out of the water so as no, to no longer have a navigational hazard. Cumming, on the other hand, tried to bid to the true aspects of the contract to where he was going to remove cargo and possibly the vessel. Ross, in 1884, was actually working on the jetties. He is the man who designed the mattress that holds our jetties in the St. John's River today. 
So his big contract in 1884 was harbor improvement, and it was not the Maple Leaf. This is conjecture, but I feel certain that what happened was he went out there and actually blew the site up and never attempted to try to remove any of the cargo. And that seems to be substantiated by further reports from the Army Corps of Engineers. This is an 1888 report to Congress. An obstruction was found lying in 20 feet of water. Appears to be an iron frame of some kind, about 15 feet long and 17 feet high. It is probably a portion of the wreck of the steamer Maple Leaf. It probably was a portion of a huge A-frame that supported a walking beam. He removed that, and then in 1890, again, the, United, the Army Corps of Engineers reports to Congress, obstructions at the site of the steamer Maple Leaf, an old pile supposed to be from a former beacon, an iron pipe of what seemed to be a piece of the deckhouse frame, and all were removed. Now think back on our 1878 river chart, a former beacon. And this comes from Lieutenant George W. Roeder, Assistant Quartermaster, 13th Indiana. In the hold, we put tents, sutler goods, and the ordinary baggage of a camp. I went up on the gunboat Norwich. I did not see that anything could be saved. And here's what's important. There was a large portion of the camp and garrison equipage of three regiments and of brigade headquarters in the hold. Now we're going to go in this camp. And we're going to look around and see what those things might be. Now I will caution you, my text does not always follow my slide. You may hear me talk about Brigadier General Foster and you may see General Sherman. And if that bothers you, then you've missed the point. <clears throat> I want you to look on the table in the tents and around the camp, see what type of things we may have seen placed on the maple leaf. Well, surely there were tents, and that involves canvas, tent poles, crates, wash tubs, anything these people were not able to put on their backs, they put into the cargo hold of the maple leaf. Ordinary things, tools, camp tables, cookware, pots, pans, utensils, Things of ordinary value that in their own time may not have been quite valuable, but now may have a very significant cultural value. Even that transit. And my favorite documents. What you see is a pigeonholed desk has a top to it. It's where all their letters and documents were filed. You can close that box Take that thing and shove it six feet down in the oxygen-excluded muck of the St. Johns River, and the chances of that paper being preserved 100 years later is excellent. Now, I want to read something to you for a moment while you're looking at this pigeonhole desk. Now, I'm reading out of a book that was written in 1866 by William Lyman Hyde, and it's titled... History of the 112th Regiment, New York Volunteers. 1866 now. The statistical history has been gleaned with great labor. It might have been fuller in regard to the early history of the regiment, but for the fact that many of the company books and papers were sunk with the steamer Maple Leaf on the St. John's River in the spring of 1864. He goes on to say, on the 20th of February occurred the disastrous battle at Old Lusty. On the 22nd, the mail boat from Hilton Head brought the order for Ames's brigade of Gordon's and Foster's brigade to take transports to Florida, leaving tents and extra baggage. We were not expecting this order as our brigade was much more broken up by details than others. And the idea of leaving our new comfortable tents with all their nice fixings for a winter campaign is not at all exhilarating. I looked upon my neat camp table with its convenient drawers and rack full of little slips of papers and letters and books. Alas, shall I ever again sit by it and read letters and write to my friends far away. He never had that opportunity. You might, but he never did. 
The 31st day of March, the steamer Maple Leaf arrived at Jacksonville, bringing the camp and garrison equipage of the regiment. Before the freight was taken off, the steamer was ordered to Palatka. Early in the morning, this ill-starred vessel came in contact with a torpedo floating in the river, which exploded under her bow, sinking her at once. Valuable company books and papers, which would have been of essential service in preparing the statistical records of the regiment, as well as the tents and other property of the regiment, were all lost. The loss of personal property to officers was severe and embarrassing, many of them having left at Folly Island everything except the clothing that covered them. Documents concerning the siege of Fort Sumter. Letters to girlfriends, to wives. Documents in the baggage of the 169th New York Infantry Volunteers. The 112th New York Infantry Volunteers the 13th Indiana Infantry Volunteers, the baggage and camp equipment of Brigadier General Ames's campaign headquarters, the baggage and camp equipment of Brigadier General Foster's campaign headquarters, $20,000 worth of two sutler goods, and the personal property of 42 Central Floridians evacuating Florida for fear of their life. Now, to put this in perspective, let's take the 13th Indiana for just a moment and follow her and see how she participated in the war and what action she was involved in. They enlisted in Indianapolis, Indiana for a three-year term. They immediately moved and participated in the Battle of Rich Mountain. They fought several times against Stonewall Jackson in the Shenandoah Valley. They moved east and fought in the Peninsular Campaigns. They participated in the siege of Fort Sumter for many months. They were within three months of being discharged on a three-year duty when all their stuff loaded up in the Maple Leaf was deposited directly in front of what is now Club Continental. What you see in the center of that screen is a buoy attached to possibly the axle of the Maple Leaf. Now, for a minute, we're going to try to put this in even a greater perspective. And I'm going to show you the two of the greatest 19th century excavations that have been done. The USS Cairo was found in 1956 by three gentlemen in the Yazoo River in Mississippi. It sank December 12, 1862. It was an ironclad vessel. They immediately tried to create enough energy and effort to raise this boat. And it wasn't until seven, eight years later that they were able to accomplish this feat. They had four and five heavy cranes out there. It was buried 36 feet underwater into the sand. They ran cables underneath the boat attempted to lift it up, and in the process, severed it in twain two times. So it is now in three sections. But when they did finally get into the hatch, what do you think they found? Personal items, cones, razor blades, still sharp and usable. Watch, cups, bottles, personal effects of people leather goods, still preserved, remarkably preserved. Look at this cannon. The cannon was blocked, still loaded and fully charged. Congress awarded $5 million to build a museum to house these artifacts. An ambrotype, photographs of people. This was the wife and child of one of the officers who went down with this vessel. It was a mammoth project, and it has now materialized into quite a museum, quite an attraction. Over 500,000 people a year go through this museum to look at this boat. It was the first ship to have sunk in action by a torpedo or a mine. 
Now this vessel, bear in mind, was a armed ironclad. It had very few personal items on it. But even at that, they removed over 6,800 various artifacts, of which 1,200 of them are now on display. Now we're going to talk about the greatest of all time, the Steamboat Bertrand. In 1968, Jesse Purcell and Sam Corbino decided they were going to go out and find the Steamboat Bertrand, supposedly had sunk near Omaha, Nebraska in the Missouri River. As incredible as it may seem, they found this boat located in a cornfield. The river had changed course. Now they come out here with this auger and they start drilling a hole down here and at 32 feet down from this cornfield, they start coming up with broken wood, lead shot, brandied cherries, broken glass. And they go out thinking, man, we have found the Bertrand buried in this field, 32 feet underneath. They finally acquire the rights to excavate the vessel. When they started, they had six people working on drag lines. At the height of the operation, they had over 60 people working. They sank 410 well points. They were evacuating 4,000 gallons of water every minute, 24 hours a day. And when they got into the hatch, what do you think they found? The canners, caster sets, ironstone china, butter churns, Patent medicine bottles, the largest bottle collection ever to be produced. Leather goods, textiles, paper. This boat yielded over 10,000 cubic feet of artifacts. It has truly yielded the largest quantity and variety of 19th century artifacts ever excavated. This boat was carrying 200 tons of artifacts. Now, unlike the Cairo, it had a massive quantity of artifacts, but no personal attachment. Their cargo was being shipped out to be sold to people in the mining district. The Maple Leaf, on the other hand, has the personal effects of over 2,200 people. We had the names of each of those people their haversacks, their trunks, their pigeonhole desks. Now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that I see anywhere in my imagination enough well points to lower the water table of the St. John's River. But one of the problems with doing a dry excavation like this is that artifacts begin to decompose at the stem as fast as they do at the stern. So there are some serious drawbacks to what they've done here. You have to get those artifacts treated and underwater and taken care of immediately. And look at this. This boat sank exactly one year to the day that the Maple Leaf sank, April 1st, 1865. And the first boat to come to the rescue of the passengers on this vessel was named the St. John's. Now for a moment, we're going to talk about archaeological prospecting. We're going to show you what we have done and how we have found the maple leaf and what we intend to do with it. This is a site looking southeast. Several years ago, we hired a team from Geo, named Geoscience Inc. out of Gainesville, Florida to produce a nuclear precession magnetometer survey of the site. Brought all their equipment out. We towed a boat north and south, east and west, constantly picking, picking up metal detecting signals and produce this high-resolution graphic display of metal densities. What you see does not represent a, so much a geographical distribution as it does density of metal. And that center spike obviously represents many tons of metal. The black line represents approximately 178 feet, which is the right proportions. But what's important is that the background is relatively quiet. You'll also note that the, the boat tends to be raised up, which is consistent with a metal survey of a shipwreck site. So now what do we intend to do in the future? We've took, taken all of our information that we know about the Maple Leaf that's available, and we've put it on a computer-aided design machine. Now, there's a lot of gray in this, but what it gives us is a working diagram, one that we can gain ideas on and change very easily.
we can zoom in on different parts of it and improve the diagram. And what we, what we will do is attempt to go in, now let's look at this. This is the front of the boat. Now we know there's a cargo hold in there. We also know that it struck an explosive device 30 feet from the stem and blew a hole in the boat. Now that does not mean that all those, all that cargo and all those artifacts just vaporized and disappeared. Those were things that were packed in there with tent, cotton. What I suspect happened was that hole was imploded into the boat. Those artifacts are probably still intact, certainly hurt, but not, not damaged to any great degree. The boat flooded with water and sank. But because it is not in as, as pristine a condition as the back of the boat, we'll choose to go into the back first. Now you have to understand that the entire top portion of the boat is gone. Currents have wrenched that portion off. What exists today is the deck buried six feet below the mud. And we will move that muck, attempting to find the hatch, and like in our other two boats, what do you think we'll find? I tell you, it will be the personal articles of people, thousands of people. who were caught in a terrible time. They were forced down here against their will. Many of them were forced to leave their homes. Many were wounded, maimed. Personal articles with names attached to them. Many of these people survived the war and returned to any town USA. One such person was Brigadier General Adelbert Ames, the gentleman you see sitting down in the center of that screen. He retired from the Army, became governor of Mississippi, senator, moved to Ormond Beach, Florida, died in 1913, and at the time of his death, he, or right prior to his death, he was the oldest surviving full rank officer to have ever fought in the war. His campaign chest and his personal baggage are still in that boat, the Maple Leaf. What you see here is the only known photograph of the Maple Leaf in extent. And it is our hope that this summer we will actually penetrate the aft portion of that boat and be able to bring up some artifacts and maybe come back and actually show you some things. Thank you.